I think it's really important that we challenge ourselves. And in doing so, yeah, you don't learn anything from winning a fight, but you learn an awful lot about yourself from, from coming off second. Hello and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 184, and thank you for being here today. On this episode, we hear from Sensei Phil Knight, a karate practitioner from the UK. Here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring year, and on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host as well as the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you tuning in for the very first time. You can find the show notes for this episode at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which is also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. As a thank you for joining that list, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick, tells you about upcoming guests for the show, and even gets you discounts on products once in a while. We recently upgraded our website, and it's time to tell the world. Now you can receive notifications when products come back in stock. You can keep items in your shopping cart and get to them later from, you know, even different devices. And there are a bunch of other great features. We put a lot of time into it. So please check us out, whistlekick.com. And thank you for doing so. Sensei Phil Knight comes to us from England and we get into some great stuff. We talk about martial arts culture, including comic books and how they've had an effect on so many of us. Sensei Phil, as he asked me to call him, strikes me as a very thoughtful martial artist. And I think you'll agree after listening to today's episode. Let's welcome him to the show. Sensei Phil, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Very excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. I appreciate you reaching out and letting me know you wanted to come on because, you know, having people that listen to the show come come on makes my job so much easier. You you know how we do this. You know what you're in for. I don't I don't have to worry about <laughs> your concern over whether I'm going to try and catch you from the side with some kind of of strange question. You know, this is not daytime expose television as some of the guests that I've reached out to have, have wondered, you know, am I, is he going to put me on the spot and ask me deep, dark questions about my teenage years when I, I wronged that person? Of course, that's not anything like what we do on here. We just talk about martial arts and we tell stories and have a good time. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Cool. We start the same way. You know this. How did you get going in the martial arts? Well, that's an interesting question for me. There are actually two different answers. There's, there's the answer that, that I tell casual acquaintances that, that see that I, that I train in martial arts and say, oh, Phil, how, how, did, how did you start? And I tell them that I, I used to do a lot of swimming as, as a sort of eight, nine, 10 year old. I used to swim for my, my city and local area. Um, so swimming four or five times a week. And one particular swimming training session, uh, my parents took me to, a, to our local sports center. And as I was getting out of the pool and getting changed and, and, and coming out, there was this, there was this group of, of 15 or 20 people stood outside a sports hall wearing white pajamas and, and stretching and doing these, these head level kicks. And I was just intrigued by that. And that is true. That did happen. And that was, was where I, I found the, the karate club that, that I ultimately uh, joined first but the real story is yeah, when i was a child i was i was I suppose still am a bit of a nerd in, into science fiction and comics and, and so forth and my grandmother used to go into our local city every week and buy me a comic book and one day she came back with this comic book with this this colorful character on the front called iron fist and I've even still got the, the, the specific comic from 1976, um, issue six it was. Um, and, and this character didn't have any superpowers, really. He, his power was, was he was a, a, an excellent martial artist. And it, it just sowed the seeds in my mind so that when I did eventually go to this sports center and, and see these guys doing these amazing kicks, that was the point at which the, the two things coincided. And I was able to... to get my parents to allow me to go to the karate class without having to sing too nerdy and too geeky at the same time. So um, sad to say, I'm still a nerd, still read comic books, but I also still do karate after 42 years. Oh, sorry, 32 years. I don't think there's anything sad about that. 
you know, there's certainly been a <laughs> shift in in our lifetimes around the acceptance of let's call it deep intellectual pursuits or non traditional intellectual pursuits, what some people might call nerdy, geeky sort of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Uh, you know, over here in the United States, I, I believe it's the number one sitcom is, is the Big Bang Theory. And it's, I mean, it, the whole premise is around nerds and comic books and things like that. And, and if you look at culture right now in terms of television and, and movies, there's a whole heck of a lot of stuff coming out of comic books. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, things like the, you know, the, the Iron Fist right. um, series on uh, on Netflix at the moment, things like that, absolutely. Have you watched it? I have. And I'm um, curious of I, your thoughts. Um, I'm enjoying it immensely. I'm on episode 10 or 11 at the moment. Um, I, I think some of the choreography leaves a little bit to be desired if you compare it with things like Into the Badlands. Um, but... I, I, I like it. I like the characters. I have some issues with the, with the lead characters' martial arts capability, but I suspect as we move into perhaps season two and other things that it might improve. As I understand it, reading around the subject a little bit, he, he's not had an awful lot of time to prepare. And of course, as we may talk about later on, there's always this, this divergence between casting the right actor for a particular role and having a martial artist who is competent to, to portray the, 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 the choreography, the fight scenes within the, within the context of the story. And, and, and you understand that the, 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 the producers have a difficulty with that kind of thing. Um, but it doesn't just quite convince me as a martial artist. Yeah, I, I would agree. And you mentioned that disparity between acting and martial arts as it happens mm -hmm. on film, you know, digital film. And it's because of that that Daniel Wu is the star of Into the Badlands. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to be around the show. And I believe he's one of yeah. the executive producers, but they couldn't find anybody. So he said, fine, I'll do it. No. The big thing for me, and no. I actually just put a, by the time this comes out, it will have been a few weeks, but uh, as we're recording just a couple days ago, I put up a blog post about Iron Fist and how for me, the thing that I'm loving the most is the attention to martial arts detail. You know, the, the way the dojo is represented and, the student teacher relationships, you know, some of the nuance that we never get to see in martial arts programming. And to me, that's the exciting part that the, the people behind the show are willing to put time into that detail. Yes, I, I, I do agree. I, I think that there are very few mainstream um, media TV movies that have ever addressed this relationship of, 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 a, of an instructor to a pupil. And, and it's not a major element of, of Iron Fist, but it's, it's actually driving some of the story in the, in the kind of the latter half of, of the series. So it's, it's nice to see. Um, and, and as you say, although it's highly fictionalized, it does give perhaps lay people a bit of context about some of the things that, that you know, we talk about on it, with our discussions between martial artists as well. Mm, for sure. Well, this gives us some sense as to, to how you got in to the martial arts, but what was it that really kept you? Was it, was it the, the satisfaction with living out, you know, a, a more realistic version of these martial arts fantasies from comics or was it something else? I think, I think for me, when I joined um, the Karate Club initially, it, it was about the, I suppose that the youthful drive to be able to do things that other people couldn't do, the kicks, the punches, the avoidances and so forth. But uh, my, my first instructor w was very keen on the self-defense elements of, of martial arts and karate in particular. And as, as, a, as a smaller child, I started karate when I was 10. Um, the self-defense elements worked well for me because my my teenage phase my, my uh, adolescence was as a smaller child in large schools not being bullied all the time but occasionally and martial arts didn't give me any any way of violently opposing that because that's not the kind of person that that i, that I was was then and, and am now but it gave me confidence and knowledge of things like avoiding situation situational awareness and and Although I, I've changed styles, I, I stay at karate for two reasons. And it, it's the self-defense uh, self elements, 
and it's it's this this confidence, this ability to overcome other things that I think feeds back into martial arts training quite strongly as well. So those are the two things that that I didn't know were going to be there when I started training, but over the years have kept me. Even though there's obviously been times when interest wanes as you get older and become interested in other things than training as you hit that 17 18 19 type um, age but those are the things that i keep coming back to and those keep me driving forwards in what i'm doing great a similar experience to what i've gone through and i'm sure to what plenty of our listeners have as well yes tell us a story tell us a great martial arts story i'm sure you have a bunch of them but why don't you pick one um well one that springs to mind and i'm not really quite sure what this story says about martial arts in general but i'll tell the story and then perhaps you can tell me what it makes you think okay. perhaps it's about humility humility and hubris but but let's see um the 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 club that I trained at as a child and, and moving into, into young adulthood was um, a Wadaru variant. Um, so relatively soft um, um, style that, that peeled away from Shotokan in the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and, and one of the key elements of, of the style that, that I trained was, was avoidance. The club is called Taisabaki Do, which is the, the, the way of the avoiding body, basically. So we did all the usual kicks and punches and, and blocks and so forth. But everything was built around a, avoiding conflicts, lateral movement, sideways, backwards movement, away from an opponent. Um, and my instructor, uh, Sensei Ben Warren, uh, was, a, a, I suppose, a big wig in the local karate association. So every now and then on our seniors training night, which was on a Friday, we would have um, a brown belt come from another club, another style, to do some kind of grading. Um, and, and on one particular day, I would have been, I, I was a Dan grade at the time, so it would have been uh, 87, 88, something of, of, of that order. So a fair number of years ago, I was relatively young and inexperienced myself. And um, there were a tranche of, of similar level black belts who come through the, 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 the gradings with me at, at the same sort of time. And we were there for this, this, this Dan grading that this, this gentleman had come for. And he, and he came from a, a kickboxing style. Um, so he was very, very hot technically on strong punches and kicks, shin strikes and so forth. Um, and, and being honest, he was, he was a bit cocky, a little bit arrogant, but he certainly had the, the skills to back that up. I fought with him, a number of my colleagues did, and you know we held our own, but we weren't a, a fighting style at that time. And, and he made us look bad. Um, and as part of the, 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 the grading, obviously we went on at, at, at one point in the evening to the um, self-defense element of, of the grading. Um, and my instructor, Sensei Warren, asked one of my uh, black belt colleagues just to do a very simple um, walk through lunge punch and oizuki, a front punch towards this brown belt and he very clearly told him to avoid the punch and do some kind of block and return. So my colleague, a, a gentleman named Steve, um, lined himself up into a, into a forward stance, he then cuts a dash stance, walked through with what was a very fast, strong lunge punch. And this poor brown belt stood there and did a perfectly good head level block. Unfortunately, it, it just didn't work. Steve's punch went straight through his block. He hit him on the nose, uh, knocked him flat on his back, and he was unconscious for three or four minutes. And obviously, we, we carefully got him, got him up, brought him round, and that was the end of, of that gentleman's grading. Um, and, and like I say, I, I think it says a number of different things. It, it perhaps talks about his his hubris, his his assumption that whatever we could throw at him, he was able to, to cope with it, and that clearly wasn't the case. Maybe it says something about styles shouldn't mix at gradings. I don't know. But for me, it, it taught me a lesson in humility. I was involved in that grading. I was quite angry with, with this brown belt because he made us look a bit foolish during the, the committee, the fighting phase of the grading. Um, but it taught me that you can never be arrogant in any situation involving martial arts. You really have to 
listen to people, try and judge what's going on around you, and, and maybe even do a bit of research before you turn up at a grading about the club that you actually be grading at. So, uh, yeah, he didn't have a good night. We all felt terrible. But hopefully everybody learned a lesson. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And for you to carry that forward so many years says that it really did have an impact on you. Oh, very much so. Um, you know, I suppose another thing that, that perhaps bring home, brings home is, is potentially how dangerous martial arts are for, for people that, that, that don't control them properly because, it, you know, a single punch could have done an awful lot of damage to a person. But I think for, from my point of view, it's made me a lot more careful when I'm organizing committee or, or what we call an IPON committee, which is standing fighting attacks from a distance. Um, you just have to be a lot of care, lot, uh, quite careful, even when you're dealing with quite senior grades, that, that everybody's safe and everybody's happy. Yeah. In my time, I found that whether it's martial arts or other things, people generally know more than they think they do or less. And <laughs> when, I, when I apply that perspective, most of the problems I've had with people or the circumstances like you're describing have come from at least one person in the mix who knew less than they thought they did. Absolutely. Well, um, it, it does remind me of, of another quick story, if I may, as well, Please. where I, I, I trained at, 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 at the, the Kaisabaki Do style until probably about 2004, 2005. Uh, and then family commitments and, and, and work overcame that. And I, I very briefly stopped training for a period of, of, of a couple of years. And I started at a, at, as a beginner again at a, at a different style, um, a Shukakai style. Um, and although I started as a beginner, I did start with all the baggage that I'd had from, from being a second down black belt, you know, for, for many years. Um, and I don't think I was arrogant per se, but I probably didn't give my new instructor the same level of respect intellectually. As, as I had my original instructor from all those years ago. And the thing that, that, that changed my mind was uh, the new style was a lot more, or is a lot more um, fighting orientated. So we do a lot more sport fighting. Um, and I can remember one training session quite near the beginning. So I would have been, if not a white belt, then certainly no more than, than a yellow belt um, in, in Shukakai at the time. And, and, we had a, a sparring session and I had done a little bit before and I was quite cocky and, and things were going well. And then I began fighting with the instructor. And although I think I held my own for a yellow belt versus a, versus a very senior Dan flat belt, um, at the end of the session, I managed to get through it. And then I went into the changing rooms and I was so exhausted and I, I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating it. I laid on the floor and got changed on my back because I was just so physically exhausted. I couldn't stand anymore. And, and that was the point at which I thought, something here has got to give. It's not going to be my body because I've managed to get through this just. So perhaps my attitude needs to change a little bit. And, and it, it, it's brought me forward certainly into, into my current philosophy of, of, of training where um, if people know an awful lot more than you do, you just damn well better listen to them and make sure you, you pay heed to what they're telling you. And since then, I, I, perhaps I've adopted a path of least resistance a little bit more with with, with the new style and, and my new instructor as well. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think people who, who think they know more than they actually do sometimes need to be um, readjusted, shall we say. Mm. Absolutely. Now, we've heard a little bit about some of the other things that you enjoy, comic books, other nerdy pursuits, as you put them. Do you have any current hobbies beyond that? Are there things that you're really passionate about outside of martial arts? Well, if, if martial arts has taught me anything at all, it, it's taught me that you have to um, live in the moment and appreciate what you've got. So... Um, it's it, it springboarded me and I don't think it'd be, it'd be too strong to say this, that, that, that being able to do martial arts has given me confidence to do things like set up my own business. Um, I, I was laid off, um, in around about 2000 and 
can. Um, and it was martial arts that not only got me through that, but also gave me the impetus to set up my own business, admittedly in a completely different field, but it was the confidence and the drive that, that it gave me. Um, and I think that it also makes me appreciate my my family and my, my work-life balance as well. Um, and, and I basically have three things going on at any one time. I, I have work, and because, as you know, when you work for yourself, you work perhaps longer hours than those people who are wage slaves. Um, I have my, my family, and then I have my martial arts, which is my kind of escape, um, and those three things work in tandem. But, you know, in terms of, of, of hobbies and interests, I'm, I'm a voracious reader, um, lots of current affairs, still lots of geeky comic book things going on, um, and it, it drives my wife mad, but I can't sit down. I'm kind of continually on the go. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not a sitter. I'm a, an up-and-doer, basically. Um, so yeah, sometimes the martial arts are a good way of burning off the excess energy that I seem to have all the time. Yes. Yeah. You, you were not the first to use that connection, that, that martial arts, uh, sort of constant movement connection. I, I think that's why for so many young people, kids that can't sit still, it, it's just oftentimes the best thing. I've seen miracles really happen with some of the the most oh. disruptive children I've ever met within a, within a martial arts oh. school. Very much so, and I think for, from my point of view, when when I first began training, um, the job within the dojo that, that I used to really really dislike was taking the beginners. My original style, we used to train, and it was part of our syllabus. We used to have to to do formal teaching in order to achieve our next belt grade um, from I suppose, the middle or the belts onwards, from orange, green belt onwards, just for very limited periods and, and with some high level of supervision by, by senior instructors. But when I was given the job to take the beginners for 10 minutes, I used to hate it. However, now I run my own dojo, I understand that, that obviously from an, an, an economic point of view, we have to have new blood into the club all the time to, as we all know, you know, one out of a hundred people will stick at, at martial arts in order to achieve the, the, the very highest grades. So we need a constant influx of, of new people all the time. But from my point of view, I now get genuinely excited when I get a call from a parent or an email through to say my eight-year-old wants, wants to start training because not only are they the lifeblood of, of martial arts for the future, but I think back to all the things that, that martial arts has given me as an individual – and it's absolutely vital that we carry on giving that to people because in modern society, discipline and um, I, suppose, I suppose the word honour, it isn't there in a lot of instances. At least it's not instilled in, in, in every family, in every situation. And I think if we can help with that, then it's really, really important. And, and both my kids have taken up karate not necessarily because they wanted to, but because I felt it was really important from a from a life experience point of view that they had some kind of martial arts training because I think it gives an excellent grounding. Just e even a year or two of training in, in Aikido or Karate or, or Kung Fu or whatever the, 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 the martial art is, just gives a fantastic grounding for people as, as individuals, if nothing else, putting aside all the ability to, to look after yourself and confidence and so forth. Just... To, to develop the personality in the way that I think we do very positively within martial arts. There's a reason I notice at the various schools that I train or teach at that even the parents who no longer train, most of them did. They recognized that for them as kids, even six months or a year, or, you know, you said two years, that little bit of grounding, that context for really the way the world works has such lasting effects. And, and we say it on the show all the time that, you know, there's nothing else that does this for people the way that martial arts does. And, you know, if it, if it didn't work, if they didn't think that time was valuable, they certainly wouldn't put their kids into training. No. And, and thinking about it, Jeremy, of, of my, I, I train a, a beginner's class twice a week and, and then an, an adult main class twice a week. And thinking about it, I have a, I have a, a tranche of, of senior belts 
Um, and all of them, I think without exception, have all arrived at my club as a result of their kids starting training and the parents seeing what the kids are getting and thinking that I would like to have a bit of that as well. And and it's, I'm not sure what, it's entirely relevant, but my father, who's now 81, and in great shape for an 81-year-old, he says it's the biggest regret of his life that when I was 10 and he was in his early early 40s, that he didn't take up karate on the same night that I started because he sees what I gained from it. And even though he's relatively fit and healthy now, he just feels he could have been far more so had he taken that opportunity. But it just circumstance didn't allow it at the time, and and it is a regret that that he has. So it's, it's I think it does go to show what what we can we can pull from the martial arts if we're prepared to put a bit of effort in. For sure, we've heard about a lot of kind of deep things. You know, you're clearly a very thoughtful person. And I'm sure that just as many of our guests, most of our guests, maybe I dare say all of our guests, you've had some rocky patches. You mentioned something about career changes in there. Mm. But I'd like you to think of a time, whether that's that or something else, where things got hard. And tell us how you leaned on your martial arts training to get through it. Well, there is, there's one particular occasion that, that really springs to mind and, and it, it is to do with 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 when I was laid off um, at the time my um, my daughter and I had started training together when I took up the, the, the new Shukakai style uh, my daughter Megan um, started at the same time as me as a, as a beginner and, and my mindset was very much to, to give her some confidence as, as a young girl and, and a bit of self-defense acumen and so forth. And so we'd been training together for probably five or six months when, when this, this career change happened. Um, and, and I was, being honest, quite, quite down. Um, at the time, I was well into my 40s and new, exciting, highly paid jobs aren't necessarily available for people who are you know, changing career at that kind of age. So I was considering the options and thinking about going, you know, looking at uh, my own business and so forth. And I can then remember very, very clearly, and, and it, it does make me you know, fill up a little bit as, as, I, as I think about the occasion where I'd been, I'd been laid off um, I'd had to go training because I wanted to carry on as normal for, for the kids. And, and Megan and I were, we were, we were doing the initial warm up at, at the class and we were running around the edge of the dojo um, preparatory to doing various exercises and, and so forth. And, and you know, Megan just, just as we were running together, just touched me on the arm and said, dad, are you okay? And it, it wasn't her reassuring me as a daughter, although she obviously was, but it was as a fellow student of, of karate. We were there together. Whatever happened, she was going to support me. Um, and I don't think that that was the, the, the final spur, but it was what really set me on the, the thought process to, to, to go it alone, because I knew that I would have the support both from my family, but also from, from, from my martial arts friends and, and, and colleagues. So it may just be that it was the situation that we happened to be at training, but I, I do think that, that having that, having the, the routine, the, the ability to take your mind off your problems and to know that if things go wrong, you'll always get the same response at, at martial arts training. You'll never get um, pity. You'll never get sympathy. You'll just get support. And I think that's uh, a, a vital element uh, at any point in your in your life, but particularly when things are are, are getting you down, that you really do need that. Um, and and conversely, um, my daughter is now nearly seventeen and has had some issues as a teenager. Um, but I think she'd be one of the first people to admit that that her training, where she may have moaned about having to go training every now and then, because she's a seventeen year old and you know is interested in boys and music and so forth. But I do think that she'd agree that, that the martial arts has been a really important um, central column in her adolescence for me. So I, I think it's, it's not just sometimes about what we can, we can 
put in and, and give to martial arts, it does give us things back as well. And I think that's really, really important to bear in mind. I agree. Absolutely. You know, in, in modern society, we don't seem to do as good of a job forming community, in, at least in the same way. We tend to have a lot more connections via social media and such than we did 10, 20, 30 years ago. But for most people, and I'm not going to say all, for most people, those connections aren't as deep. But martial arts and other pursuits similar give you a community, something to lean on when you need that stability. And it's something that I, I, I'm imagining that everyone listening right now is probably nodding their head as I say this, that you know, it doesn't take very long in life to, to reach a rocky point, even if it's a small thing. And to realize, hey, the stability, the the grounding, as you put it earlier, and I, I'm liking that word more and more, that I have from my training and the people I train with can really help me through a lot. No, absolutely. I think it's, for me, it's just become a, an integral part of, of, of what I am and, 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 you know, how my life works. Uh, and I think if, if we can encourage people to participate and to get some of that, then it can only be positive for, for society generally. Sure. You've talked a bit about your two instructors. I don't know if you've gone off, yes. if you've trained with other people, but I'd like you to ask the que question that you know about who's been the most influential on you. But I want to take those two out because we've heard about them. And I'm wondering if there's maybe somebody else that was formative. Yes. Well, I, I have trained with with a number of other people, um, and I've I've done um, as well as karate, um, little bits of judo and aikido as well. But I think from a from an aspirational point of view, certainly in recent years. Um, I've done a bit of, of, of reading research around um, a guy called Bear Grylls, who is a he's a UK personality, and, and he, he may may have been aware of him in, in the states as well. But he's a gentleman who, um, when he left uh, university, he trained uh, as a Shotokan martial artist, a, a, a fairly hard form of karate, and became a, a black belt. And then he used his martial arts skills to earn a living while he decided what he wanted to do with his life. And he ended up becoming a, uh, an adventurer, uh, a survival expert. He joined um, the British special forces. He survived um, a, a parachute accident that, that broke his spine and recovered fully afterwards. Um, and I think uh, as a, as a, uh, as an aspirational figure, as somebody who, um, we strive not to be like, we can't emulate other people, but to try and take the, the good things from their life experience. I find that, that, that he's one of these, these, these things that keeps cropping up when I'm talking to people, when I'm trying to explain it in a, in a, in a training session, why I want people to push harder, to work harder. He's one of those figures that, um, that I'd really be interested in, in, in meeting and interacting with and has certainly in my, my, the second part of, of my martial arts career in, in my most recent style has, has driven me on to, to push that a little bit harder and, and to try and you know, not accept second best. Hmm. For sure. Now, if you could train with someone that you haven't, who would that be? Um, that I have met. That you have not. Oh, have not. Okay. Well, there, there are two people that, that I really, um, if I was able to go back in time, well, let, let's get the obvious one out of the way that sure. everybody says sure. that, that everybody wants to train with, with Bruce Lee. Right. Um, and I, I, I'm old enough to remember Bruce Lee the, the first time around, more or less, um, and, and his, his skill. And I think as I've gotten older, his, his intellectual capability it, it is, is staggering. Um, but, but going back a little bit further than that, the founders of both of my styles uh, of karate that, I, that I've trained, Sensei Otsuka, who founded Wadaru, 
uh, and Sensei Tani, who created Shukakai, um, I, I have this fascination as somebody that, that, that has, has trained within two different styles uh, of these, these senior masters who took what was then the, the conventional, traditional martial art, um, uh, Sensei Atsuka moving from, from Shotokan into creating his own style through a, a, a series of learning experiences with, with other masters and other uh, karate students in, in Japan and Okinawa. Um, those are the kinds of people that I would dearly love to have been around 40 or 50 years ago to have been able to, to train with. Um, and I think now, I, I, think, I think we are diminished in, in some respects. I think that there are, there are too many different styles and too many non-traditional styles out there. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it really is a case of everybody to their own. And people will, like me, find styles and, and ways of doing things that suit them. And that can never be a bad thing. But those are the, the, the two people that, that I trace my martial arts lineage back to. I would like to, if I could get in that time machine, go to Okinawa or to Japan and just see what they were really about. For sure. Let's talk about competition. Has competition ever been part of your martial arts career? Um, well, I'm, I'm the world's most competitive person. Okay. Um, I, 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 I don't like to lose at anything. Um, but interestingly, martial arts competitions have never really formed a, a major part of, of my training. Uh, my, my original style just didn't do sport fighting. We occasionally, on, on a Friday night, last thing, we used to put the gloves on and we used to have a, a bit of a go at it. But I certainly found out when I moved into a more fighting uh, biased style, um, it, you know, in, in the 21st century, that. Um, my limited abilities were, were sorely lacking, as I've alluded to already. Um, so I, I do do um, uh, sport fighting now, but I'm not a great competition enterer, just from the point of view that I'm 46 years old, and I really don't fancy fighting some of the um, the very, very experienced black belts that have been fighting for a, a number of decades. Uh, I don't think I, I bring anything to it particularly. Uh, but what I do bring... Um, to a training session is whenever I'm fighting with with my students, um, I want to win, even though I'm an instructor. So I do have to so pull back sometimes from 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 pushing too hard in in competition. Um, but I, I do think that that competition more generically is really really important because w without that drive to improve what we're doing, it, it's very easy to become stale. So even though Sport fighting isn't my natural background. It's something that I try to include in as many classes as possible that, that I take because I think it's really important that we challenge ourselves. And in doing so, yeah, you don't learn anything from winning a fight, but you learn an awful lot about yourself from, from coming off second best to a better opponent. And I think that's the key message for me when I'm training my, my students at, at fighting. Um, but... Um, yeah, to give you a non-martial arts related story about competition and myself, I, I used to, to play some, some racket sports with my dad when he was younger. And um, we had one occasion where um, I'd been on a squash court uh, with my dad playing squash. And I get very uh, vocal when I lose. And I was having a bad game. And uh, there was a lot of screaming, a lot of shouting. And um, not too much profanity, but... Perhaps, perhaps the odd swear word did escape in frustration, and uh, to the point where we actually had a formal complaint from the from the, uh, the, the the squash court next to us because they thought that I was making far too much noise. So um, yeah, I don't like losing. Perhaps that's why I don't do too much um, uh, fighting at karate in competitions. <laughs> if I did lose, I wouldn't really be wouldn't be very pleasant afterwards. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with being competitive. It certainly is a, a driving force and something that a lot of people, a lot of very successful people have used to their advantage. I think that the downside, and I'm not getting the sense that this is you, but when the desire to win becomes so all-encompassing that it excludes other things, or on the flip side, after a loss, people can't pick themselves back up. 
yes, it, it, it's about being being balanced, and and I think that a good martial arts school will teach that lesson very early on. That I mean, I, I can still very, very clearly remember failing my purple belt grading. Uh, I would have been 14, 15 at the time. I was devastated. But um, my instructor would not allow me to mope around. He gave me all the, the really worst jobs in the dojo. He gave me the worst classes to teach until I cheered up and got on with training. And I made pretty sure that I passed that grade in the second time. So it, it, competition is great. It gives us goals. It gives us a challenge. And it gives us a character building exercise where we fail and have to pick ourselves up again. And if you pick, if you, if you, if you um, get nothing else from martial arts than the ability to um, um, carry on after adversity, then you're doing pretty well. Hmm. You mentioned Bruce Lee earlier. And movies, martial arts, culture, really as it is. Do you have any favorite martial arts movies? Now, this is one of those questions that I've listened to the podcast before, and I, I, I thought, this is the question I'm going to really struggle to answer because <laughs> I don't watch martial arts movies. Okay. But, but then, but then I, I started Googling, and I realized that if you, if you Google 1980s martial arts movies, I have seen virtually all of them, and I, I just I just think it must have been um, almost by osmosis because I did martial arts uh, and therefore I watched all these films without really realizing that they were um, what what my what my wife calls karate films. Now we're not allowed to watch karate films at home anymore because she's not really that much she's not into watching martial arts movies. Uh, but you know, you name it, I've probably seen it. So I I, I have. Kind of two different tranches of, of martial arts films. There are there are the good ones, and my, my two favourites are Enter the Dragon and, and Roadhouse. Um, but then I'm a real sucker for those 80s exploitation, uh, kickboxer, uh, blood sports, um, you know, the, the American ninja type films, those things that have awful production values. And the only thing they have going for them is that they have martial arts in and often really good martial artists who couldn't quite make it as as mainstream actors but when they 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 actually get to choreographing the, the fight scenes you know the fact the film was made on a shoestring and you can see the boom hanging in at the edge of the camera it doesn't matter because you're just drawn to the action on the screen so you, know, you name the the awful 80s and, and early 90s um, no retreat no surrender type film and I've probably seen it and really quite enjoyed it to my embarrassment as well I don't think there's anything embarrassing about that <laughs> whatsoever I, I'm in the boat with you and I'm going to guess most of the listeners that at least grew up through the 80s remember those films and maybe they won't admit it publicly but they're probably right in that boat with us there's something I think I think there's something really special about the bad martial arts movies that have the good acting because it allows us to just kind of let go and not pay attention and, and tune out until the next fight scene. Yes. You know, the plot doesn't matter. The plot's the same. You know, there, there are really two or three plots in almost every martial arts film. <laughs> yes. But those action well, sequences, I mean... We, I don't know about you, but I've certainly walked down the street in a strange city and passed a martial arts school and just had to stop and watch what they're doing. It could be a class of white belts. It could be a class of yeah. five-year-old white belts who, you know, they're running around and the instructor has absolutely no control over what's going on. I'm still going to watch because it's martial arts. There, there is exactly that. I was going to say there is something about martial arts that, that when you, you've done some – it becomes hypnotic. I cannot walk away from um, a, a class, from a, a, a news item that has, a, in the UK, we have a lot of, of, of um, end of the news stories where it, it's a, a lighthearted or a, um, a non-news story to make the news sound happy. Uh, and, and quite often it will be a five-year-old black belt who's just graded and they'll be breaking, breaking blocks or something on at the end of the news. 
And, and although I have my own opinions about whether a five-year-old could actually be a black belt, that, that's a different story. It, it's just you can't take your eyes off it because you think, wow, martial arts on television, it's just brilliant. But you know, going back to what you're saying about about the the the, um, the, the fight scenes being um, the, the the thing that that you watch for in, in a in a bad martial arts movie, there are some mainstream films where, take for example, John Wick. Mm. I honestly have no idea what the story of John Wick is. I'm sure there is one, but but all I do when I watch it is fast forward past the talking to the next fight scene. Um, and there's a number of films like that, and and it, it comes back to to at the moment, my the, the way I I classify action films is those films that have proper martial arts based fight scenes, and those films that just have people hitting and kicking each other. And I can't see the point of that latter category. I'm not interested in watching. I mean, the classic proponent of, of that was, was Arnold Schwarzenegger, who really had no proper martial arts chops. He was just a, a bruiser. So although I've watched a lot of his films and enjoyed them, I would rather see a, um, well, Patrick Swayze is, a, is an example, Roadhouse. It's not a martial arts film per se, but it has some fantastic martial arts context that, that is based upon proper martial arts done by a competent person that, that, that understands what he's doing. Um, and, and that's my favorite actors in a martial arts context, are people like Swayze and Wesley Snipes who take an ability to actually perform the techniques that they're showing on screen and then integrate it into a more interesting story. Mm -hmm. I agree. How about books? Are you at all a martial art book reader? Um, I, I, I've dabbled over the years. Um, my, I'll be honest. Since um, since the advent of the uh, of the Kindle store, I really don't buy books anymore. Um, I, I flick through a lot of, of, of um, audio books and, and online books, but th there are some that I keep coming back to. And, and I think most martial artists will have read The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, and I'm one of these people that, that every now and then I will I'll pick that up, flick through and find a, pa a passage, a, a quote that, 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 that suits my, my mood or my life at the time. Um, and I mentioned Bear Grylls. Um, he's written a really good autobiography, which talks about his, his early martial arts training and, and goes on to other things. Uh, the book is called Blood, Sweat and Tears. So that's one that, that I've, I've read over and over again. Um, and, and then a, a non-martial arts book, but a, almost a, a, a Zen type um, experience for me was a book by a, a gentleman called Rich Carlson called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And as I say, it's not a martial arts book, but it's a book that takes some of the the, 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 the Zen sayings, the idea that, that life can never be as bad as you think it is, and turns that around into a positive. And, and quite often when I'm taking a, a training session, I will pick up Carlson's book and I will... I will read three or four pages, and they're very short, very pithy, um, to the point um, anecdotes and sayings and, and ideas. And I'll use them as the basis for what I'm going to talk about when I'm running training that night. So although I, I'm not a, a voracious reader around the history of martial arts, um, when I find something interesting that I think is appropriate, I'll dive on it. I mean, at the moment on my desk, I've got a book by a gentleman called um, Goran Powell, who's a, a karate uh, instructor and student in the UK. And I'm partway through his book, and he's talking about that, that his life, his training in, in, in martial arts. Um, and it's about uh, something called the 30-man uh, kumite, a challenge where you have to fight 30 fighters in a row one after the other, starting with the most junior fighters and finishing with fight 30, which is with the most experienced and dangerous fighter. And frankly, it's terrifying. But it, 
like all good martial arts books, it gives us the history, it gives us the context, and then it gives us something to aspire towards. And that's the kind of thing that I will pick up and read. It's amazing how our lessons in martial arts, as we know, tend to drop out into the rest of our life, but there's just as much, if not more, that we can pull in from other things to our training, to our perspectives. Do you have any anything that you're you're working towards, any martial arts related goals or something on the horizon for you? Um well my my current style. Um I'm a I'm a, a first dan, and um, I've been first dan in Shukakai for coming up on three years. And between the um, the requirement of, of running my own dojo and work and family life and so on, I have um, uh, been quite, um, shall we say, um, a bit what's the word? A, a UK word, an English word, lackadaisical, not particularly focused very well on, on grading. Um, so we have a, a system of um, test gradings called pre dams in my style. So I took a pre dam for my uh, second dam uh, in March, three or four weeks ago, and passed the pre dam. I'm now working towards a, a full second dam. Um, so I'm doing an awful lot of, I mean, the, the the karate stuff is going very well, fighting the um, what we call attack and defense, the self defense element of it, the basic techniques. I've got a lot of things to improve on. I've got to work on on um, arm placement with with blocks and and a number of different things. But um, it's the physical element of things that that I need to work on. So I'm doing a lot of fitness training at the moment and. Uh, one of the things that, that I did mention when we first talked about me coming on the podcast was was my thoughts about um, training as a 46-year-old is radically different than training as a 15, 16-year-old. Um, and one has to learn to cope with the knowledge that, that physically, I'm probably no longer in my prime, that I have to work an awful lot harder and for longer to maintain the same physical capability that I did even five or six years ago. So um, again, another challenge for, for martial artists as you get older is acknowledging that we are no longer necessarily in our prime and working towards making the martial arts work for us as we get older. So that's my biggest challenge at the moment, planning to survive my second down grading in full uh, without killing myself in the process. All right. That's a pretty good goal. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's... Come, 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 come back to me in June when I take the grading. We'll see. <laughs> well, I hope you let us know. Let me know and I'll let everyone else know how it, how it goes. I have no doubt that you will be successful. You, you know, that, that competitive side and, and certainly you have the, the knowledge and the context for what martial arts is at this level, at this age, that you know what to do. You just got to do it. Fingers crossed. That's right. If anyone's listening and they want to get a hold of you or, you know, maybe they're, they're traveling over your way. We haven't even really talked about where you are. Uh, how would they get a hold of you? How would they know what's going on with you? Social media, website, any of that? Let us know. Absolutely. Well, the two best ways of getting hold of me are Twitter. Uh, my uh, Twitter ID is at local venture one um and also i have a blog uh which is localventure.blogspot.com and the, the blog it, it's very much focused uh, as the name implies towards my towards my work and uh, i talk about my business and and general ideas around how businesses in general should should work but i do the occasional post on on martial arts uh, and also on slightly geeky things as well. So if people want to catch up with me, then they can do worse than taking a look at the blog. But you know, if, if people are ever in the north of England, um, I have uh, an open door policy in my dojo. So if um, people are ever in the north of England, in Yorkshire, uh, they get in touch via Twitter. I'd be very, very happy to have um, people from any fighting style um, join us for training. Um, I really do think... My experience with the, uh, uh, the 
kickboxing brown belt, notwithstanding that that we've all got an awful lot to to, to learn from each other. Um, and, and I know that you know, I always learn whenever I walk into a dojo something about myself or martial arts in general or life in general. And the more people we can interact with doing that, the better. So if anybody's interested, I'm always available and always happy to chat on Twitter. Wonderful. And of course, we'll link that that blog, your Twitter handle, get some photos and, and everything over at the show notes for anyone that might be new. Those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That brings us to our last question. What advice would you have for the people listening? Well, uh, as somebody who has um, trained for a lot of years and has gone through two different styles of, of, of martial arts, both to, to Dan Grade, the biggest single lesson that, that I would that I would uh, give to people is don't quit, carry on. Um, when I initially stopped training in the early 2000s, just even though for a very brief period, I missed it like mad uh, and really, really enjoyed getting back into it. And I think that, that if you can stick at it, if you try to be that one person in 100 that gets the black belt, you really will get out far more than you put in. So it, it's just not giving up. It, it's carrying on. If you find a, a style that you, that you can't get into that you don't like, try something else. Um, karate may not be for you. It, 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 you may be a, a, a judo person. You don't know until you try. But try for you. Try different classes. Just go for it. And you know, the more people we can have turning up at dojos, not just mine, every dojo out there, new people turning up, it just makes life so much more interesting for those of us that are training within within martial arts. And everybody wins. As this show continues on, I keep feeling like I need to go on some world tour to meet all these wonderful people I get to speak with. Sensei Phil seems like someone I'd have great conversations with over a pint of beer or just in the dojo. Thank you, Sensei Phil, for coming on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with photos of Sensei Phil, links to the things we talked about, and some other stuff. You know, if you haven't checked out the Bear Grylls autobiography he mentioned, it's definitely worth a look. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Username, Whistlekick. You should also check out the Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Hopefully, you're helping us spread the word about the show, whether that be messaging links to your friends or taping them to a chair, putting on some headphones. Whatever method you choose is entirely up to you, and I am going to encourage you to subject them to this show, even if it's against the will, because it's that good of a show, right? You're listening. <laughs> Check out the updated whistlekick.com and let us know what you think. Thanks for listening today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.